in fact osteotomy is coming out of the shadows of knee replacement uh, uh, we have conducted more than three osteotomy courses uh, but now with the um, uh, covid the situation uh, with a lot of webinars the interest is really picking up and while there has been a lot of light on the varus knees uh, is, is still is a challenge uh, to do an osteotomy for valgus knees especially the reason why we to share our experience in dealing with uh, the valgus knees and uh, make it easy for us to understand and do this technique better and as uh, dr vijibo said uh, this is not a mirror image of a medial joint osteoarthritis the crucial difference being uh, you find an anteromedial erosion more than medial joint whereas the posterolateral joint erosion is very common in lateral joint uh, osteoarthritis like medial joint it can undergo a rapid progression because uh, the tibial condyle is convex on the lateral side while it is convex on the medial side and it needs a lateral meniscus for the integrity of the cartilage if you lose the lateral meniscus the lateral compartment is much likely to deteriorate very quickly and unlike the medial joint osteoarthritis it is very frequently associated with patellofemoral and rotational malalignment issues so one has to be careful in assessing all these uh, uh, problems before you just go on with coronal pain corrections and one has to understand if you look at this image uh, you can see uh, the the femur, the lower end of femur has uh, two different articulating surfaces in flexion and extension whatever osteotomy you do it will unload the knee unload the distal femur in extension only so you had to warn the patient that some uh, symptoms in flexion like pain on sitting and getting up may persist despite your a distal femur osteotomy so these are the crucial points which differentiate uh, the lateral joint oa from medial joint oa and before you undertake an osteotomy you have to answer this uh, three questions first does the knee require correction and what are your indications so if you draw the weight bearing line if it goes 10 mm towards the lateral side it is considered to be a significant significant mechanical axis deviation and these are the level, uh, types of deformities that we need correction and uh, the indication typically we offer osteo distal femur osteotomy is for a deformity which is cosmetically unacceptable and functional functionally uh, compromising and more and more we are offering uh, uh, dfos for joint protection whenever there is lateral joint osteoarthritis or if you do a restorative procedure like cartilage repair or a meniscus repair or a meniscus transplant on the lateral compartment and very rarely i have done few cases for uh, neglected mcl deficiencies with valgus knees in these cases uh, whatever mcl reconstructions you do if you neglect the valgus deformity it is going to fail and also in cases where there are a lot of uh, recurrent dislocations of patella in the presence of a significant valgus your patella reconstructions uh, is also likely to fail unless you correct the valgus malalignment the second question which you need to answer is um, when and how much is the deformity and it's very simple to assume that all valgus comes from femur but one has to be aware certain amount of valgus can be contributed or the deformity can be entirely within the tibia as well so it's very important to have a proper x ray and do a proper deformity assessment and it's very important to know about these two angles the lateral distal femur angle and medial proximal tibial angle which will indicate from where this valgus deformity is originating from whether it is coming from femur or tibia and in this talk we will be highlighting about this miniaci method uh, you all know how we can use this method for calculating for tibia we will be showing how you can use the same technique to uh, calculate your uh, level of correction amount of correction using this method for a valgus knee and then it's very important to look for a rotational component it's very important to examine clinically to make it short you can do these three tests in your clinical assessment one is a foot progression angle when the person is uh, seen walking you can observe the foot normally the person should keep the foot around 10 to 35 degrees of external rotation the second test what you can do is uh, make the patient lie down prone and bend the knee and uh, do the internal rotation and external rotation a normal Uh, torsional uh, alignment will have 30 degree external rotation and 45 degree internal rotation and you can also note the thigh foot angle once again the patient lying prone and knee flexed to 90 degree the 10 to 30 degree of external rotation of the foot long axis compared to the thigh is normal if you find anything abnormal in these three values you have to strongly suspect a rotational component 
uh, or a rotational model element is very important to assess rotational components in a valgus knee, which is much more common, common than when you're doing an osteotomy for a varus knee. Coming to the radiological planning, which is the core of this talk, uh, we go through these uh, three steps. First and foremost, you have to get a proper full length X-ray. And second, you had to go to the deformity assessment, which comprises of uh, first identifying the location of the deformity, whether it is in the femur or tibia. And then your assessment should also give in millimeters how much you had to do a closing with osteotomy. Finally, your radiological planning should lead to your surgical planning uh, what kind of osteotomy, what kind of implant you're going to do, which Dr. Kumar will be covering in this uh, talk. The first and foremost step is to get a proper standing full leg X-ray, uh, which has to look something like this. You can also a three centimeter metal ball, which has been strapped to the inner aspect of the thigh, which lies in the same coronal plane as, uh, as the bone. So this uh, measurement of this um, uh, ball helps you in calibration of your measurements in x-rays so this is how we take a long leg standing x-ray the x-ray source is kept around 10 feet the beam is centered on the knee and we are using a long cassette in this we have a special cassette which has got four uh, film cassettes which uh, a software calculates and um, stitches the film for us uh, if, you, if you you can also use a long cassette as well and there are cheaper versions uh, available from Indian manufacturers as well. As low as uh, uh, 2 lakh rupees, you can get these uh, long cassette uh, systems from Indian manufacturers. And then uh, it's very important to position the patient. The patient should be ideally taking weight equally on both the lower limbs. And the patient's anterior superior iliac spine should be at the same level. If there is a limb length discrepancy, you have to keep... Uh, uh, cardboard planks under the short leg so that you can make your ASA levels equal. And it's very important to uh, keep the patella facing forwards like this. And you can see here we are using a strap with an embedded metallic ball uh, diameter known to be three centimeter, which is strapped to the medial aspect of the thigh. So this is how a patient is positioned for taking a full length standing x-ray. And uh, then once the x-ray is taken, one should know how to assess if the x-ray has uh, come out properly. Uh, first and foremost, uh, here the patella should be facing forward. And you have to closely look at the tibiofemoral joint here. Here, one third of the fibula should be overlapped by the tibia, like this here. And also, if you look at the lateral border of the proximal tibia, this uh, should cross the fibula at the widest portion of the fibula. And then if you look at the joint, the joint space should be visible like this. It should be an orthogonal projection of the X-ray. So these are the points which will help you to identify if the X-ray has been taken properly or not. If the X-ray is not taken properly, all your measurements may not be useful, especially uh, the distal femoral osteotomy for valgus is a very demanding procedure. And it can also complicate sometimes, as you can see in this patient, the patient primarily came for a recurrent dislocation of patella with a valgus knee. When we did this, there is a significant valgus, but uh, here you can see it's very difficult to center the patella because the patella is subluxating. So one should be aware of the patella problems also when you are taking these x-rays. Uh, let's go to the radiological planning. First and foremost, uh, once you get the full length weight bearing x-ray, one has to draw a weight bearing line, also called the Michelix line. Um, it extends from the center of the femoral head to the center of the ankle. And then normally it passes two to four millimeter medial to the center of the tibial joint surface. This is normally, it is slightly medial. It doesn't go to, to the, through the center of the joint. And then one has to look for mechanical axis deviation, the MAD. If you find the weight bearing line is going beyond 15 millimeter from the center, it is a significant deviation on the medial side. But if it goes beyond 10 millimeter on the lateral side, it is considered to be a significant lateral axis deviation. And uh, this is an important two angles here uh, called LDFA and MPTA. The LDFA is called the lateral distal femur angle, which is made by the mechanical axis of the femur. That is a line extending from the center of the femoral head to the center of the trochlea here. Uh, and it is made with a tangential line, which just touches the articular surfaces of the distal femur. Normally, it is around 87 degree with a variation of plus or minus 3 degree. Similarly, you also calculate on the medial side, the medial proximal tibial angle. Once again, it is formed with the mechanical axis of the tibia with a 
tangential line to the tibial articular surface. Once again, it's very easy to remember 87 degree plus or minus 3 degree. Uh, for example, if in a valgus knee, if you find the lateral distal femur angle to be less than 87 degree, one can uh, be sure that the valgus is produced by uh, deformity in the femur, and you can get away with doing a distal femur osteotomy. Well, if you, in a valgus knee, if you find the MPTA is increased, like 92 degree, then you have to correct that valgus from the tibia. You should not be correcting a tibial deformity in femur that will ensure in joint obliquity, which has to be avoided. So this is an example to understand the joint obliquity. You can see in this uh, X-ray, there is a valgus knee. You can see the red weight bearing line is crossing well beyond the joint and all the measurements have been made. And if you correct, as you can see in the first image, the entire uh, correction in the distal femur by doing a medial closing with geostatomy, you have a perfect weight bearing line which is restored. But if you look at the joint here, you can see the obliquity of the joints. So this has to be avoided in any situation. So here, a certain amount of valgus is contributed by the tibia and certain from the femur. So it is an indication for a double osteotomy like this here, which will not only correct your uh, mechanical axis deviation, but will also restore that the joint line remains parallel to the flow. So it's important to calculate your lateral distal femur angle and MPTA, the medial proximal tibial angle. And once you know there is a mechanical deviation, as you can see in this picture here, uh, you have to know where you're going to shift your weight bearing line. In, in patients who have only deformity without arthritis, it is better to aim the correction towards the highest point of the trochlea. It is for people who present only with deformity, you aim for a zero degree correction. People who also have deformity and an osteoarthritis, you may want to slightly unload the lateral compartment. There, you may want to shift the weight bearing line to the uh, down slope on the medial tibial spine, just beyond the medial tibial spine. So this will ensure that you have errors of two to three degree, which is quite acceptable for the situation. And then one has to know the hinge point here. Uh, basically, if you look at the X-ray, you may find the condylar shadows. The hinge point is made just above the shadow of the lateral femoral con a centimeter from the uh, cortical border. So this is how the hinge point is made. And uh, this is the point through which the osteotomy is directed. If you are doing a medial closing with osteotomy, it is an oblique osteotomy. Ideally, the angle uh, from the cortex to the hinge should be at right angle to the tibial cortical surface. This will ensure that there won't be any step when you are closing the osteotomy. And this is how we do a tibial, high tibial osteotomy correction using mini technique. Uh, you know the correction point, the weight bearing line, the corrected weight bearing line. And you have to make sure when you rotate the weight bearing line, you have to rotate the entire length uh, outwards like this. The length of the line is very, very important. And once the new weight bearing line, which is go through the intended point of correction, from this point, you're going to draw another line towards the uh, hinge point here. From the hinge point, you're going to draw another line towards the center of the angle. And this angle is subtended on the hinge point towards the medial tibial cortex. And then an opening with geostratomy is done here. Similar principles apply for a genu valgum also. But because we are distal femoral osteotomy, entire thing is uh, uh, reversed upside down. Here you can see this is the weight bearing line going laterally. And uh, this is where you're going to shift your weight bearing line. But instead of moving uh, distally, the ankle point remains stable. The, the same length is uh, moved. The same length line is made through the point here to the from point B to C. And then from C, you're going to make another uh, line towards the hinge point, which is D here. And then this line is extended to the center of the femoral head. So this angle, which is subtended, is once again created here. And this amount of which is uh, removed and closed, resulting in your correction of the deformity. So this is a planning. First, you have the weight bearing line here. And then identify the new point where you want to shift your uh, weight bearing line. It's very important. The line has to remain the same length here. And from the point C, you're going to make another line. And the line goes to the femoral head. Now you know the angle here. The same angle is drawn on the medial femoral cortex. And the closing wedge osteotomy can be done. The wedge can be removed. And then we have a correction like this. 
So surgical plan, Dr. Kumar will be explaining. It could be single plane, biplane, implant choices uh, made carefully. It's very important to consider arthroscopic procedures if the patient has uh, uh, chondral defects or meniscal tears. And it's very important that uh, these patients may also need uh, adjuvant procedures uh, like petrofemoral surgery in many cases. For ex example, people who have a lot of uh, petrofemoral pain may need a lateral macular lengthening as well, as you can see here, uh, which can relieve the lateral pressure syndrome. I'll be skipping and uh, sometimes uh, if there is a very painful osteophyte we can do partial uh, lateral facetectomy uh, remove the osteophyte along with the part of the lateral facet of the patella uh, people who present with the cartilage defects of the femoral condyle or uh, patella can also undergo uh, cartilage repair so it is not uh, very simple uh, we have to be careful about uh, all the coexisting problems as well so when not to do an osteotomy when there is a significant medial joint osteoarthritis when there is a near total meniscal loss and there is a suspicion, suspicion of infection or inflammatory condition extension or flexion loss more than 20 degree uh, poor soft tissue smokers uh, we have to undertake this uh, procedure very carefully to conclude uh, this is much more technically demanding than proximal uh, tibial osteotomy so one has to be very much uh, precise in planning and execution of this procedure uh, coexisting pathology especially the rotational deformities and the patellofemoral instability patellofemoral osteoarthritis changes can affect your outcome so you have to be very careful in clinically evaluating these conditions uh, you can also do a ct scan to make sure there is no rotational or torsional deformities uh, and add all these factors into considerations before you do the surgery with this i conclude this talk and um, thanks to ajr team for this opportunity mm -hmm.